Yeah. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we know it's a public holiday, but you know we we have a fantastic speaker lined up, which will be worth your uh, time spending uh, learning during this uh, public holiday. So I'm Faros Nada. I'm the uh, ED of uh, Global Compact Network Malaysia. Uh, we are the local network of the United Nations Global Compact, which is the world's largest movement on corporate sustainability. So today for a very uh, exciting session, uh, which we have co-organized with uh, Nottingham University Business School, we have uh, honorary, honorary Professor Tim Gosher uh, with us to share his insights on a very uh, important topic, uh, especially during uh, crisis recovery. Now, before we start off, I'd just like to, to uh, do a brief uh, uh, introduction to the, the digital tools that we'll be using to make this a more seamless experience for everyone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, house rules is we will ask everyone to, to mute themselves and please turn off your uh, video cameras. And for Q&A, we apologize up front, we seem to have a little bit glitch in the chat function of the teams. So what we are doing is uh, we are going to use Menti for, your, for the, for the uh, ask a question options. Uh, so how are you going to use this? If you go to, uh, Shawin, can you just show that? Okay. So please log in, in your browsers, go to menti.com and type in 522473. This will uh, direct you to our Q&A and also polling room at the end of it. So it's important for you to log into this. Uh, menti.com 522473. So what happens is... So once you, once you have... Uh, once you have submitted your code, you will come to this ask a question screen, click ask a question, type any questions that you want, click submit, your question should appear, and if you like a particular question, you can click like. So the idea is the most upvoted questions will be asked during the Q&A session. So please feel free to uh, ask as many questions as you like. We will be monitoring to for on this part. So with, without further ado, uh, let me please briefly introduce a good friend, Dr. Mohan. So Dr. Mohan uh, is an Associate Professor of Strategic Management and Acting Dean at the Not Nottingham University Business Schools in the University of Nottingham, Malaysia campus. So he will be our moderator for the day. Dr. Mohan, over to you. Thank you, Faroz. Um, a small correction, I'm no more the Acting Dean. I'm now the Director for Research, uh, but nevertheless. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for all the Buddhists, good wishes for the Vesak Day of Buddha Purnima, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to try to take just a minute and walk through uh, one of the most illustrious colleagues we have, Tim Ghosh, the speaker for today. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Dolma Impact Fund. Uh, I don't want to talk what is impact because we are going to leave it to Tim to tell us that uh, on impact investments. And he's now become a colleague as an honorary professor for sustainable business with the business school in Malaysia. Uh, it's been five years now we've been working together. He comes and engages with us in research and also in teaching. Uh, he has a background in private equity, energy, and technology. Uh, and we've, some of you have heard he's also a pianist now. Uh, but uh, let's come back to his uh, day job. Uh, as a private equity man, he's been in the mainstream, but he's also now come into impact investments and also ESG-related issues. And he set up the Dolma Impact Fund, which is the first international private equity fund in Nepal. And this is the reason why we've requested him. Um, as somebody who knows how to get ESG or impact funds into the developing world uh, and also supporting businesses there, we thought it would be very relevant for Malaysia, ASEAN countries or developing countries to see how companies could attract investment funds. And even if you're not a finance person, this would help in developing proposals um, uh, to, to funding agencies, grant agencies, uh, those that are looking for good impact, social and environmental impact. Tim also uh, is the chairman for Dolma Foundation, a British nonprofit organization that works in the education uh, field post Nepal earthquake. Uh, he is also working with the UK government's um, international development DFID entity on the Dolma Himalayan Climate Fund. So whether it's climate change issues 
uh, that is the environment or social issues in terms of education and business issues, we have the right person to talk and, uh, and later ask questions too. Right? Uh, thank you very much to all who've joined again. And uh, Tim, I hand over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, I will say good afternoon to everybody. Most of you are in Asia, Malaysia, some in Nepal, I think Hong Kong, other places. I am talking to you from my home in uh, Essex, just near London. Um, we are in lockdown. I think Malaysia is on the way out of lockdown, but I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, I wish you all a happy Vesak day, uh, very much celebrated in Nepal, the country we invest most in. Um, as the, uh, I think, the birthday and the commemoration of Nirvana. I can't offer Nirvana today, but hopefully I can offer some small enlightenment. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Just a quick, if everybody could put uh, mute on, that would be great. I have small children too, who may threaten to come in. Um, I want to just check that my slides can be seen. Uh, Dr. Mohan? And your slide was on earlier, but it went off. Uh, just, just try again, please. Yes, okay. we are on now. Yes, sir, yep. Okay. Good. Now, uh, please do ask questions. It doesn't quite have the ambiance of a University of Nottingham lecture hall, but the questions will help. Uh, I'm just going to put that in presentation. So what I thought we would cover today is what really the definitions of ESG and impact and the types of impact investment. Um, who are the investors? What's, uh, what forces are driving that investment? I'm going to give two case studies from some of the investments we've made uh, in companies. Uh, and of course, uh, we couldn't talk about impact investment without um, mentioning coronavirus. I'm going to try to finish by 10 past nine, so in about half an hour, to give plenty of time for questions and a poll at the end. But I'll start by introducing what we do at the Dolma Group. Um, in 2003, I founded the Dolma Foundation, uh, which is a non-profit, actually uh, giving scholarships for education mostly. We've also done, if you like, impact investment in ecotourism. Uh, but in 2014, we launched and raised the first private equity fund for Nepal with uh, institutional investors from Europe. Uh, and I'll be talking more about the impact strategies of Dolma Impact Fund, as well as Dolma Himalayan Energy. OK, I wanted to start with a definition because the terms of ESG, impact investment, um, uh, social entrepreneurship, they're often confused and they are indeed overlapping. Um, but I'll tell you the way most institutional investors look at this. Um, I won't read this out, but ESG is uh, a governance policy in a company. Um, it covers obviously environmental and social issues, uh, but and so at Dolma, for example, we have um, a ESG policy for every company. We do an environmental, um, environmental and social action plan. We have an environmental and social management system for every company, which tracks um, all of the risks, mitigations and actions to do with environmental and social governance. Um, I wanted to mention, though, that ESG, <clears throat> in order for it to work, has to go beyond policy. It's really a culture. Um, and it's very much synergistic with governance in general is something we've learned. If we find a company as an investor which is poor on ESG, it's very likely that we find them poor on legal governance, board governance, financial governance, etc. And so I think our experience is that this is not some sort of add on to a company's policy. This is really core. It's the way you think uh, about business. It's the way you think about quality assurance. Um, 
The main standard we use for, there are lots of standards out there for um, ESG. The main standard we use uh, is the IFC performance standards. IFC are the private sector arm of the World Bank. Um, and they have uh, eight issues. You can see here how we break down um, some of these issues. Um, in places like Nepal uh, and indeed anywhere, um, labor and working conditions are a big deal. What you find is that these performance standards go usually over and above the local law. So you find yourself doing that. Why do you do that? You do that for ultimately commercial reasons. Um, the reason is this: these are risks. If you ignore labor, if you exploit your workers, if you um, screw people on the land acquisition price, if you ignore biodiversity, it will come back to bite you. Um, and so really we see ESG A as something in the core of our being, but also very much a commercial risk mitigation strategy. I should mention that on this call we have uh, Dolma's uh, head of impact and environmental and social governance, Sandeep Shrestha. Um, and we're going to go through lots of acronyms in a minute. Uh, he is available during the questions if you'd like to address any questions to him on how to measure these things, how to implement these things. Um, impact investment is separate in my mind from ESG. Impact investment, if you like, ESG is risk mitigation and a core of a company's mission. Impact investment is looking over and above risk management, measuring and tracking the social and environmental benefits. So if you like, ESG is trying to do no evil. Impact investment is trying to do good. Within impact investment, there are various investment strategies, and I like to talk about this spectrum. Um, all impact investment uh, aims to create a social and environmental benefit alongside a financial return. And therefore, that financial return could be zero, or it could be whatever the market return is for the risk of that investment. Um, and you can see here, obviously, if, if the investment intention, obviously some commercial investments are below zero, but if the investment in, in the end, if the investment intention is to be less than zero, that's called aid, <coughs> not impact investment. Um, but in some cases, uh, like Dolma, some of the funds mentioned here, they're very much what's called finance first impact funds. We at Dolmer Impact Fund see our objective um, as developing the market in Nepal by creating a track record of attractive returns. In a country which has very little foreign direct investment, we think the ultimate impact we can have is to create attractive financial returns, which encourage, encourages more financial investment in the country. Um, but there are other strategies. So we are focused on a market rate of return. And therefore, we look at that alongside the environmental and social benefit. Uh, we do not, for example, subsidize. Um, and so you could see a scenario where, for example, we own a pharmaceutical factory. And it may be socially fantastic to give away medicine in certain cases. Um, but if that is done for our company and it artificially lowers the return, all we would be doing is lowering the perceived return in a country like Nepal, thus attracting less investment. That's not to say that we can't partner with charities or NGOs um, who can help to give away that medicine. But in other cases, there are investors like Acumen Fund, for example, which uh, have largely a donor base as opposed to a private sector base of investors. Um, and in those cases, they will subsidize returns. And this is especially relevant in more developed markets 
you see in the UK impact investors um, looking at really solving social problems, really crossing over with uh, governmental, almost third sector. You see increasingly a lot of charities, um, Oxfam and their impact fund. Um, really, they'd be happy if they get a very small return um, and achieve certain uh, social or environmental objectives. So you'd call those impact first investors. You can see here at the bottom of the slide um, some of the standard setting bodies, which I'm also going to talk about on the next slide. Um, this is an extract from our latest impact report. Um, it shows how we measure impact and the standards um, that we follow. Um, you can see there an alphabet soup of standards. Um, some of them are our investors and we have to follow those standards, of course. Um, IFC performance standards I've mentioned. Um, gender is an increasingly important issue. Gender equality, I'm going to talk about that specifically in a second. One of the main standard setting bodies are GIN, um, which I encourage you to look at. Recently, we have, um, so we do a separate ESG report every year based on the IFC performance standards, and we do a separate impact report. Um, recently, we switched to aligning that reporting with the SDGs, which I encourage everybody to do. Um, and here we can see um, some examples of the five key SDGs that Dolma Impact Fund is focused on. Now, there are many ways that you can measure <coughs> SDGs. It's quite a flexible framework. Um, you can see here that we invest in renewable energy, and so we're creating um, nearly 7,000 gigawatt hours. Um, the projects are currently under construction. That's why there's nothing in 2019, but they'll start coming online next uh, this year. Um, We've also uh, generated a lot of jobs. Um, you can see here nearly 4,000 jobs in Nepal through our the direct jobs created. Um, that figure is over 5,000. We also have through our portfolio investments in Kenya, the Dominican Republic, the US, the UK. Um, and that's a significant number. Um, uh, we've also uh, implemented gender equality policies. Now, for those of you talking to uh, Western, perhaps Australian, um, European, American investors, gender equality is an increasingly important topic in impact investment. Um, we stop short of quotas. Um, we don't say companies have to have a certain number of, of females on the board. What we do, and it's amazing what can be achieved, is we implement uh, gender equality policies, uh, anti-discrimination policies, not just for gender, of course. Um, and it's amazing to see um, that, it, in fact, one of our great statistics not here is that 92% of our female employees in our portfolio are skilled workers. Um, and so we see a lot of engineers, a lot of computer programmers, um, et cetera, in our portfolio. Another interesting thing we implemented is a way of measuring lifetime impact per million US dollars. And that gives a quantitative measure for, obviously, as a private equity fund, um, our investors, our limited partners can see the financial returns that's done every quarter and in our annual report. But what we're trying to bring out here is what return are you getting beyond that on these SDG metrics? And that is what's uh, listed in the last column. Coming back to something a little more theoretical. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, back in the, I can't remember when, 60s, 70s, when Milton Friedman came up with the groundbreaking um, uh, theory of shareholder theory, which stated that uh, the job of a business to maximize its positive impact on society 
was to purely focus on shareholder value. Now, the world has moved on a lot since then, uh, and we've seen what can happen when there is perhaps an obsessive focus on shareholder value. What happens is the garment factory collapse in Bangladesh, the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, um, the oil spills in the Mexican Gulf, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you can see what happens when shareholder value starts to bleed into greed. And it's very interesting to compare uh, Friedman's doctrine with the UK Companies Act. This is the latest version. And I would point out here that it doesn't mention the word shareholder. It talks about members. A director must promote the success of a company for the benefit of its members. And it mentions employees, suppliers, customers, the community and the environment, all as stakeholders. I want to point out that I believe that Milton Friedman's theory and the evolution of capitalism are actually consistent. Uh, Friedman's approach, his objective was to benefit society. I think what we found out is that all of these things, by focusing on a broader set of stakeholders, actually you are promoting shareholder value. If you do not, uh, focus on employees, society, environment, customers, etc. Uh, you are simply taking a risk. You are taking an unnecessary risk. And so the balance of modern business and modern capitalism is indeed, as Friedman suggested, to create shareholder value. And you destroy shareholder value by ignoring the broader set of stakeholders. And I think this is the basic theory that is evolving in business today. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, landscape of investors. Who is investing in impact? Who are the, if you had a company and you wanted to raise money, um, who who is investing in impact? Uh, foundations. Uh, you will find foundations that um, have more of a perhaps impact first policy. Family offices, high net worth individuals corporations through their CSR budget. I want to stop there and just define CSR as well, because it's another slightly overlapping term. Um, CSR, broadly speaking, is um, what a corporation does with its profits for social and environmental good. Um, it is not, um, as impact investment is, generating benefits for society and the environment through doing its core business. But corporations have CSR budgets. Development finance institutions, most Western countries have them. They are effectively sovereign wealth funds focused on um, developing markets. Now, Malaysia is probably too wealthy um, for development finance institutions. They're looking at poorer markets, uh, India, Nepal, a lot of our investors are development finance institutions, uh, FMO from the Netherlands. Um, other examples are CDC from the UK, IFC itself, uh, the private sector investment arm of the World Bank would be uh, considered uh, a DFI. Um, there is an increasing number of private sector institutional investors which have um, started investments. Um, could I just ask everyone again to put on mute because I am getting some background noise. Thank you. Um, what we've seen recently is a trend. Uh, AXA, one of the world's biggest insurance companies, uh, Allianz, the Rise Fund is a very high profile fund um, co-founded by Bono. Uh, it was set up by TPG, which is one of the world's largest private equity fund managers. So over the last, I'd say, three years, we have seen most of the large pension funds and insurance funds launch impact arms. Now, this creates a really interesting uh, dilemma and opportunity. Of course, pension funds cannot um, do impact first strategies. They are managing your pension. 
Would you want them to invest uh, for a zero percent return? Probably not. Uh, would you want them to invest in highly risky, perhaps a Nepal that could offer an Nepal investment that could offer a 30 percent IRR, but is also very risky and could be worth nothing? Uh, possibly not. And so these private sector institutions, which manage most of the world's money, um, Allianz, uh, the German insurance company, manages three trillion dollars, for example. Um, they have to abide by a fiduciary duty to their policyholders to invest their money for a, a balanced risk return. They cannot take uh, too many risks. They cannot target 1% return unless it's a sovereign bond, perhaps. This moves me on to, um, excuse me. This moves me on to what is driving impact capital. Obviously, there are regulations coming out of uh, the UN, or filtering down from the UN, the COP meetings. But one of the biggest things that's driving private sector impact investment um, is actually returns. And by impact investment here, I mean more it development in poorer countries. Um, and in a sense, that includes mainstream emerging markets like Malaysia. The reason for that is interest rates have been low since the financial crisis. Nobody thought that 12 years on, we would still be at close to zero interest rates. With coronavirus, that is set to continue for a number of years. What that means is that the biggest managers of money, let's say life insurance companies, they have promised, they know they have to pay out a certain amount in 20 years time, say on a life insurance policy. And their objective to meet that liability to, was to invest in securities that give a certain rate of return. So they may have thought that the German Bund um, or the US Treasury uh, safe securities would have given 2% over 10, 20 years. In fact, as you can see now, they are giving in some cases negative interest rates. And so these private sector investors need to generate more return. And that is pushing them into riskier investments, not necessarily impact investments, but certainly taking more risk. That means going to emerging markets, so-called frontier markets, and taking more risk. So we're seeing this pressure on the world's largest investors. There's also a big push from philanthropists. Um, you can see the major Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Dell Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, all involving in philanthropy and, of course, the major aid organizations. And also there's a big push from shareholders, policyholders and the public. So you see uh, the big funds starting. The first step is we're not going to invest in oil and coal. Uh, now it's moving into more positive impact strategies. So these are some of the major drivers as to why the availability of capital for impact has grown so much. I'm going to quickly cover two specific uh, examples of our impact investment. And I'd like to say first that what binds to me successful impact strategies is a mission. Is a mission that all of the employees, the country, the society involved can get behind so that you can bind people to that mission. Um, if you can create that kind of movement, if you like, the financing will usually flow. Of course, you have to have a good business plan with good returns. In this case, Dolma Himalayan Energy um, is something that we worked first with DFID, the British government, uh, who provided a grant. The mission is to stop the Himalayan glaciers melting. It's no less ambitious than that. Now, that may sound very, very ambitious, and perhaps it is, but here is the situation in the Himalayas. The Himalayan glaciers are the third largest store of frozen water on Earth, sometimes called the third pole. They are melting fast. Uh, about 30% of their mass has been lost over the last few decades. And unless things change, two thirds of that mass will be lost by 20, uh, 2100. The reason for the glacial melt is not only global warming. 
This map you can see is a map of black carbon, more commonly known as soot. And that soot rises from the plains from the south of the Himalayas, and it's caused by coal-fired power, people burning fires. Uh, in Nepal, 75% of primary energy is created by burning wood. Uh, it comes from poor exhaust. It comes from polluting factories. This is reversible. Um, it's reversible if we can roll out renewable energy extremely rapidly. Um, and of course, with the technologies of solar and battery, which we're using, we can do that. It's worth mentioning the social and, and environmental catastrophe, which is already happening. Immediately to the south of the Himalayas with Nepal bordering Indian states of India and Bangladesh, that uh, comprises 600 million people, which is the densest pocket of extreme poverty on Earth. Um, a lot of people think sub-Saharan Africa, um, but actually it's not. It's Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Nepal, Bangladesh. They are immediately at risk of flooding. 28% um, of them live in extreme poverty compared to the global average for South Asia. So this is a very dense pocket of vulnerable people. And because of the Himalayan melt, um, they are suffering. And you can see how they suffer here. Um, you can see how the floods spread out from the region. Um, you can see me there uh, on one of our Dolma Foundation trips to give emergency relief after a village was completely wiped out in an instant from a landslide, which are increasingly common. Um, and we wanted to do something about that. So we launched Dolma Himalayan Energy. Um, we got two uh, private sector infrastructure investors uh, after DFID. Um, they are Infraco Asia. Um, out of Singapore and Climate Investor One, at a private equity fund out of um, the Netherlands. Uh, we are developing large scale 150 megawatt uh, in phase one solar plants, but solar plants alone do not help uh, poor countries because they're very intermittent. Uh, the, the, the grids are weak, and if you put intermittent power, every time a cloud goes over, the power drops, it will crash the grid. Also, it doesn't generate power when you need it the most. Um, when it's needed, of course, is in the evening peak when the sun typically has gone down. So we've seen the cost of lithium ion batteries drop, um, especially as these gigafactories are produced, primarily driven by electric vehicle production. And if you combine batteries with solar, you can manage the generation. You can shift it to that peak. And that is what uh, we are developing throughout the Himalayas, eventually, initially in Nepal. My second example is uh, impact investment in cloud and AI. Um, we've invested in two companies in this space, Fuse Machines, which um, trains uh, students in Nepal who have perhaps a computer science degree, but are not ready to work in the latest AI software development. We train them, we put them on projects remotely, mostly in American um, leading edge companies. But Fuse Machines, I say we because I sit on the board, Fuse Machines uh, also has an online learning platform. Um, and their mission, I talked about the importance of having a mission, is to democratize AI. Um, Cloud Factory, um, another mission-driven company is uh, provides data management services for AI companies and machine learning. This is the concept of big data. For example, they will work for self-driving car companies, tagging frames of videos for obstacles. What can the algorithms recognize? They would work with insurance companies, tagging and managing huge data sets to feed into AI algorithms. This work, while Fuse Machines hires high-end software developers, Cloud Factory has some high-end software developers, but the majority of their employees are so-called cloud workers. They can work from home. In fact, they're definitely working from home at the moment. Um, and it's fairly low skill. It means it's available to many people. So here what we've seen is the whole spectrum and these companies together um, 
I think have around two and a half, three thousand employees. Um, what we're seeing with the rise of the combination of the cloud, artificial intelligence and computing processing power is often called the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and unlike previous industrial revolutions, there is no need for the workers to be close to the, the means of production. Um, in other words, uh, in the first two industrial revolutions, of course, uh, Britain started with its factories, the workers nearby got the jobs, developed the skills, the whole ecosystem was close to where those fixed assets were. With AI, uh, and the cloud, it really doesn't matter where those workers are. It doesn't matter if they're in Silicon Valley or Kathmandu. And so our investments are building on that. Um, cloud Factory was particularly good. Uh, sometimes people look at impact investment as a separate thing from mainstream finance. I see it very much as part of mainstream finance. Um, we recently got a round of investment from mainstream multi-billion dollar venture capitalists in the US. And if I think back to a few years ago when we invested, <clears throat> we had the Rockefeller Foundation with a soft loan. We had Dolma, some other investors. And last year we managed to get raise $65 million at a $100 million valuation for um, Cloud Factory, um, very much thanks to the extreme talent of the management team. And so this was a story, almost the ultimate impact story. Impact isn't only about little companies that stay small and have a great mission. Impact should be about ambition. It should be about scale. It should be about commerce, but with those kind of core missions embedded and measured. Um, I am pretty much out of time, but again, I couldn't do this uh, lecture without talking about COVID. Dolma Impact Fund is bravely in the market and raising a second fund. Um, and we've just been through a due diligence process uh, and it's very clear where the opportunities lie. Um, a lot of people are taking a defensive strategy for which I would say, oh my goodness, my company's running out of money, please can I get a grant? And that is perhaps necessary, but we're very much taking the offensive or perhaps positive strategy. We're looking to invest in A, the businesses and sectors which will boom because of coronavirus. Those are, of course, tech when it comes to telecommunications, fintech, health tech, which can leapfrog some of the physical infrastructure, especially in poorer countries. Um, we are looking at technology, at healthcare, obviously hospitals, kidney care clinics. The second category we're looking at are those which are likely to bounce back very quickly. Uh, education, agriculture, manufacturing. It probably doesn't include airlines, oil companies. I think there are some sectors which will suffer for the long term. But if you are looking for money, try to take that positive offensive strategy. Uh, there is no better time to invest than to be counter cyclical. You want the cash during a crisis. Cash is king. And if you look at this V-curve sectors, one of the most important things you can do as an investor is save jobs because these companies will bounce back. Um, I'm pretty much done. My sort of uh, closing comments would be how to position your company for international investment. I'm very aware that some people in perhaps Malaysia uh, going for European investment can be overwhelmed by the amount of compliance, all these ESG policies and impact metrics and everything else. Um, but they are a force for good. And I think if you build impact investment at the core of your strategy um, and not just write down the policies, but you live and breathe um, the meaning behind those policies, you will be very well placed to raise money for your business. I'd also like to mention one of the unique competitive advantages of Malaysia is Islamic finance. I'm not an expert in Islamic finance, but I've always found a very close synergy between Islamic finance and impact investment. Um, and I think tapping the Islamic finance market is really almost the same as an impact investment strategy. It is 11 minutes past nine. I promise to finish at 10 minutes past nine. I will therefore 
uh, say thank you for listening and open for Q and A. Brilliant, Tim. Thank you. And and the last statement is particularly uh, impactful. The Islamic financial institutions here have indeed uh, started talking about merging with ESG kind of issues and adding the religious side of issues to it also. There are already questions, Tim. And uh, by the way, for everybody, uh, after the Q and A session. We'll try to end this a few minutes before 4.30 to run a poll on some of the issues we are interested in from the audience. Uh, the first question, Tim, you're ready. Uh, one of the participants would like to know how best can we balance Asian or ASEAN sustainability realities with Western ESG uh, or a Western impact investor expectations, something which you started ending the session with. That's very good. Um, if you think ASEAN expectations have a mismatch to, say, European investors, think about Nepalese companies. Um, there is an enormous difference in the understanding of health and safety, of gender policy, etc. Um, and it's our job as a private equity fund to bridge that gap. Um, I would say that in some cases, there is an element of decisions on policies being made in um, European capitals, which don't always apply. And we have seen that. But largely, when you get into it, when you actually understand what's behind those, sure, some of them are difficult. Um, and I'll give two examples in a second, but largely the we have found over the last many years that working closely with our investors and buying into the essence of these policies, they do become clear. Um, one example is we have accidents on our construction site. We're building hydropower plants. We're blasting tunnels. There are always accidents. Trust me. Um, you think ESG policies are expensive, try an accident. That is far more expensive and very, very disturbing for the individuals involved. Um, and so I would ask you to go with it and treat it as a learning experience. However, I've seen, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, palm oil. Uh, that is something that instead of saying palm oil is a reality, we should mitigate the risks, we should have clean palm oil, etc. There will be a bias against palm oil. There is indeed a bias against um, against hydropower. Now, there was an example when the Green Climate Fund, a multilateral fund, uh, very much driven by European ideology rather than perhaps pragmatism, um, made a trip to Nepal. Nepal's power is more than 95% produced by hydropower. It's because it's got fast running rivers. It's a totally clean resource. They're one of the least polluting countries on earth um, in terms of CO2. And the uh, Green Climate Fund gave a presentation to banks saying, we don't like hydropower. And the bankers walked out. So you've got, they, there's, there's a meeting of the minds. I think European investors need to have an, a dose of reality but also I encourage you seeking that capital to realize that what is meant behind those things is for your good. Additional accountability will make you a better investor or a better company. Lovely. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to try and merge and ask you. Uh, there's a, there are two people who are interested in changes in standards, uh, IFC performance standards. Uh, are they more stringent on issues like biodiversity or like what you mentioned? gender equality, et cetera, that people here should be cognizant about. Could I invite my colleague Sandy Shrestha to oh. answer that if the technology permits? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Are Sandeep, you there? You, Sandeep, if you can hear us, just unmute. Yes, I can. Hi, hi, everyone. So um, usually the way IFC performance standard works is that it's a guiding principle. It's a framework of uh, they have combined from their learning. Um, and it's a guiding document. So when you are assessing impact, environmental or social for any of the project, 
it's based on that project uh, reality. So if you're investing in a 30 megawatt hydropower, the risk associated with that is completely different uh, when you're in, uh, investing in a tech company. So it's a guiding document. Uh, it's a principle whereby you follow the standards to identify what kind of risks that particular project or company would have on the environment and the community and the workers. So based on that, uh, you are um, identifying the risk and implementing the mitigation measures. So uh, yeah, in brief, it's it's we wouldn't talk about how stringent it is. What we're saying is. Uh, depending on the company and the project you're working on, uh, some standards or some requirements would be very strict. And, and in certain cases, these requirements may not exist. There, there, might, there might not be any impact. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, there is a question, and Tim, we leave it to you whether you'd like to share these uh, information. Uh, what is the tariff for a solar plant in uh, Nepal in terms of, let's say, dollar purchase power agreements, duration of these PPAs or such things, and even pricing for debt, etc.? A few of these points we'd like to share. That's all public information uh, and policy driven. Uh, Nepal is a um, doesn't really have an energy market. You can only sell your power to one buyer. It's the Nepal Electricity Authority owned by the government. The solar tariff is currently 7.3 Nepalese rupees, which uh, the which, and the currency is pegged to the Indian rupee, and the Indian rupee has taken a hammering. So I'm, I have to look up the conversion rate, but it's probably about six six point three something like that U.S. dollars. Um, it does not give U.S. dollar um, PPAs. It does give some US dollar hedging above plants for 100 megawatts. PPA duration is typically 25 to 30 years. Um, in many ways, having a hydropower is similar. It has fixed tariffs depending on the type of hydropower plant. Um, if it's a run of river, that, that just uses the velocity of the river as opposed to a dam storage um, is 8.4 rupees in the dry season. Uh, 4.8 in the wet season um, and it is actually quite convenient to have these fixed feed-in tariffs as opposed to market. You kind of reverse engineer your project to see if it can be economical to the fixed tariffs as opposed to here am I um, uh, trying to figure out the market price uh, over time which is obviously more complicated. Um, and here's a question on time frame, Tim. What is what is the time frame that your company is usually willing to look at to invest in in, in a project before expecting to see some uh, profit? Um, how long for the return of investment that the investors would like to see? Uh, between three and seven years um, would be our target. Private equity funds typically are fixed end, closed end funds. So they fit it in our case, which is very common. We are a 10 year fund. We can have an extension of two years at the investors uh, agreement. Uh, and so that limits us. So we are sort of a medium term investor um, in complex places, by the way, anywhere. It takes a while to add value. We are very hands on with our companies. We're not sort of passive like a perhaps a hedge fund manager just buying stocks and watching the tickers. Uh, very hands on, especially with things like ESG, because that's where we can add most of the value. Uh, this question should be taken tongue in cheek and with humor, Tim. Um, one of the participants notes that the Dolma Himalayan Energy uh, Board and advisors and management are not gender friendly. That is an excellent point. Um, and that is the case with, unfortunately, many of the, you know, our companies. Um, we perform very well on gender policy relative to the country. We do stop short of quotas. I have been in situations where what I do not want to do we have in our Dolma Impact Fund team, um, I think 50% of our team is female. 
Um, and that's a team of about 20. Um, and uh, but the senior managers, um, uh, probably, you know, two out of five or six are females, so more like 30 percent in the senior management. Um, the rate of promotion, once you implement gender equality and anti-discrimination policies, um, is very good. We have very much a Western policy. But we do also have a belief that we don't want to belittle the talent of women when they know they are a particular position because they're a woman. Mm. Um, we've seen that lose uh, people lose confidence. Uh, I've actually had pushback when I've attempted to do that. Um, and I don't believe, I believe that the incredible uh, female members of our management team um, are on the way up. Um, I often speak to them, our senior investment manager is uh, a woman, and I often speak to her in her appraisal about, you know, how do you feel? Nepal is a patriarchal society. You're there probably across the table from a, a sort of rugged businessman. Um, how do they treat you? And she says, yeah, well, sometimes they, uh, you know, they look at me strangely. She's also quite young. She's, uh, you know, probably... A, I don't want to get this wrong about 30 um and uh and she says but that soon goes away when she real when they realize i've got the money so if you're sitting there with you know five million dollars sort of rustling in your pocket any discrimination seems to fly out of the window so money is a great money is a great gender level right. uh, there's a few more questions um very quickly would getting a ftsc4 kind of rating be sufficient to attract investors from Europe? Uh, FDIC? Uh, FDIC, this is one of the ratings uh, from the stock exchanges. Um, I don't know whether it's sufficient. Um, it will certainly help. Um, any being a signatory to UNPRI, FDIC, IFC performance standards compliant, you know, there is uh, many things that will help. I think the point here is what is at the heart of your company's culture, not what letters you have after the. There is a lot of greenwashing, a lot of impact washing. You know, we do great things. We're environmentally friendly. But when you really get to know the board, the owners, the management team, do they live and breathe the fact that business operates under a charter from society and the environment? And if we ignore those, that will create an unnecessary financial risk for the company, and we know we operate within that charter. Is that the core of your company's being? That is what company, that's what investors are really looking for. There are uh, two more questions and two more minutes, and I'll, I'll, I'll read out both and I'll let you choose which you'd like to answer. Uh, one of the participants would like to know, are there any plans for your foundation to bring your expertise, particularly in AI and high tech and education, into Malaysia, perhaps via University of Nottingham's um, offices. But the other question is, uh, any advice for aspiring ESG fund managers and how do they attract investors in general, especially for ones who are sitting here in uh, Malaysia or even Singapore for that matter? Uh, if I get time, I'll ask you to repeat that second question. Sure, sure. Um, but are there any plans for Dolma Foundation to come into Malaysia? No immediate plans. However, um, Dolma Foundation uh, is going to receive a share, quite a generous share of Dolma Impact Fund's carried interest. In other words, the profit share um, of the fund manager in the fund. Now, we are in our sixth year of 10 years. We've had one exit, which was fantastic. Um, we've got nine investments. We need to exit another eight. Um, and over the next few years, we will know our profit. If we were to be very fortunate with our carried interest and profit with the fund, um, we will look to expand, uh, especially into AI, um, and education, um, because I think that building on this fourth industrial revolution concept, never was there a better opportunity to equalize the global economy. 
Um, it is in fact the Industrial Revolution that caused the inequality. Before the Industrial Revolution, Britain, Asia, Africa was largely the same in terms of economic output. It is that, it is the, not through any sort of evil necessarily, but it is that creating the factories and the geographical link between those factories and fixed assets and the economic gain that created the huge inequality we see in the world today. With the, the internet, the cloud, processing power and AI, we see the opportunity. Now, if we don't jump on this opportunity, we will lose it. And the only barrier is no longer fixed asset bandwidth processing power, it's education. And so where I would like to see, where I've seen perhaps the most long-term impact in our portfolio are these investments that create online ed tech platforms to bridge that educational gap between local universities and what's needed today in American Silicon Valley firms, for example. Um, yeah. So what I would love to, if we have the funds, expand and look into that area. Could you repeat the second question? I'll try to very quickly answer it. Any advice for the ESG fund managers here to attract investors? General advice. Yes. Um, uh, adopt the IFC performance standards or a similar one. Look up what standards and policies they use. Uh, learn about them before you approach them. Be honest about how uh, much you know them. You probably haven't used them. Try to find things you have used and map them onto that. Don't pretend you know them but be willing to uh, go through a continuous learning process with your investors um, to reach the standards that they need. Uh, a few minutes over the time. Uh, thank you all so to the participants to hanging on and please stay on for a little while. Tim, um, no words can never be enough to say thank you to you, how you can distill years of experience, multitude of experience and uh, bring it across in brevity to the audience. Always a pleasure and a privilege, sir. Thank you very much. My thank you, Burroughs and the GCMY team, particularly to put it up, and my colleagues, Bentley. Uh, one of the reasons for having this topic is to stimulate even research interest and perhaps getting people interested in such issues. Uh, Faroz has started a center of excellence under the Global Compact. Uh, the business school here wants to be part of it and get our students to do projects in that area. So I, I hope this stimulates interest among people and collaborations. With that, Faroz, over to you for the poll. Uh, Thank you, Mohan. Uh, thank you, Tim, uh, for wonderful sharing. Uh, I think uh, all of us on the call will probably be energized to now to see how we can link ESG to our day-to-day -day investment decisions as well. Now, uh, before we sign off, we'd just like to run a simple poll. Uh, if I could ask everybody on the call to go to menti.com and, in and input this code that is given on at the top of the screen, and if you could just answer the, qu uh, the questions asked. So as you answer, you will see a live change in this. So let's give maybe a 30 seconds for people to just log in and start answering. Maybe last five seconds before we move to the next question. Okay, shall we move on to the next question, please?
Right, next. So this is an interesting insight, Mohan. <laughs> All right, next, please. Next. Okay, let's go to the last question. Okay, uh, that, that is the last one, right, Shavin? Yeah. Right. So, okay, uh, yeah. with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. We thank you all for participating, uh, for your sharing your insights in the poll session as well. Please do join me for a virtual uh, is a thank you to the applause and thanks to Tim for such a great sharing and insights. Uh, you know, I, 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 I am motivated the moment that we can travel. I want to go to Nepal now to, to see and learn more as well. Uh, you know, and, and, and hopefully, you know, we can have Tim coming to KL uh, often as well to learn more from him. Uh, with that, thank you all very much. Uh, please stay tuned for more webinars that we have planned in our series together with the Nottingham University Business School. And uh, pleasant day ahead. Stay safe. Thank you once again. And have a good wee day performance tomorrow Tim. Oh yes, <laughs> we still have some time if you want to okay. give us a sneak peek. <laughs> uh, uh, unfortunately we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care. Thank Thanks. you again. Thank, thank, thank bye -bye. you. Take care, bye. Bye.